a real life outbreak of werewolves in modern day South America. And then we travel to Malawat, a small country in Africa, where a spate of vampire attacks forces the citizens to take the law into their own hands. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. Day 5 of Vampire Week. Fifth episode recorded in one day. I've never done this before. I'm, I'm feeling it a bit. I'm feeling it a bit. I still have to go back and edit Monday's episode, so I'm not done yet. But if I, the sooner I can get all these episodes over, the sooner I can get back to my true passion, Minecraft. Avoiding creepers deep under the earth. You know, I've thought about this. Get back to me and tell me if you guys think this is a good idea. But for the Patreon supporters, and I talked to Dan Ash and Carson about this last night. Again, this is a week for you guys. But Patreon supporters or people thinking about becoming Patreon supporters, would you be interested in having a private Minecraft server where we could all play Minecraft together? Let me know through email or comments or whatever. But yeah, I think it'd be fun. I'm just looking for an excuse to play more Minecraft. I'm getting, I think I'm getting to the point where it's getting a little too boring. But um, yeah, I'm still playing it. Let's go ahead and get started with the episode here so I can get to editing the first episode. Now, Mason Norbeck is the guy who sent me all these vampire links. And it's funny, now that I've recorded the week's worth of episode, I think I only used like two of his ideas. I saved the rest. We may use those in the future, but I really appreciate the suggestions, Mason. Today's episode includes two of his suggestions, actually. And the first one he declared as gross. Sends it to me anyways. Sent it to me anyways, but said it was gross. I had actually read the article before he sent it to me. So I had all my research done and I just plugged his little name into it. And it was very, very easy to do. So this is a request by Mason. That actually happens a lot. I'll have a story ready to go and someone will be like, hey, have you thought about doing this? Just throw them in there. So because I always appreciate hearing uh, recommendations from you guys. So we are going to Spain. We were just there earlier in the week for the running of the balls. And now we're back. We were in Costa del Sol. Actually, damn it, I realized in the introduction I said this story took place in South America. It actually takes place in Spain, and I'm not going to edit that. So just <laughs> retroactively think, well, technically Spain colonized South America, so never mind, there's no working around that. Anyway, so Spain, Costa del Sol. So kids were having tummy aches. They're like, it's a totally true story, by the way. Tons of photos about this. Kids are like, oh, mommy, my tummy hurts. I was eating too much spicy food. And they're like, I told you not to eat all those jalapenos. And he's like, I know, but it's a stereotype. I have to fulfill my stereotype. She's like, drink some milk. And they're like, uh, maybe. But their tummy hurts. So their moms, their collective moms, go get them um, antacid. Specifically, omprazole. Omprazole. And I think that's either Prilosec or one of the main ones. Is That's the ingredient. Omprazole. Kids are like, mmm, take the pill. They're like, mmm. Oh, I've, they're starting eating jalapenos again. The mom's like, no, stop eating it. You're more than just a stereotype. They're like, but am I, mom? Am I? They're having an existential crisis. They're eyeing that bowl of jalapenos. She's like, eat a peach. They're like, okay, I'll eat a peach. Kids are eating peaches now. Their stomach feels better. And then they wake up the next morning. I don't know if it's the next morning, but just for the sake of the story, they wake up the next morning and they're like rubbing their eyes. They're like, ugh. Mm. So tired, such a. I don't know why I'm yawning. I say I'm tired. It's the morning. They're like uh, Huey Lewis and the new songs playing. They're getting ready. They go to brush their teeth. They're doing everything they can possibly do without looking in the mirror. And then they look in the mirror, <laughs> and they're covered in hair. They're like, no. And they call their mom. They all have one mom again. It's the mom of the village. And they're like, mom, mom, I think I'm turning into a dog. And she's like, yeah, it does appear that way, son and or daughter. So. What happened was there was a tainted batch of this antacid medicine. It was mixed with minoxidil. So omeprazole is for ant- for for its tummy aches, and uh, minoxidil is for people with alopecia, so hair loss. So these kids were getting this rapid hair growth all over their body. Sixteen kids in Spain basically became werewolves because they had a tummy ache. And it was kind of unclear. They said if they stopped taking the medicine, which I'm sure they would, they're not be like, hmm, furry or stomach ache. Like, just stop eating spicy food for a day, guys. 
If they stopped taking the medicine, they'd stop growing the hair, but it was unclear. I don't think their hair just would fall off. I think they would still have to shave their face and their their entire body because they look like little puppy people. They looked like dogs. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. You're like, hey, where can I get myself some of this tainted stuff? I want to be furry too. Unfortunately, it only works on children. So if you have a desire to become a werewolf or just look like one or have a great Halloween costume, that would be dope. You walk into the party, you're like, hey guys, what's up? You're like, dude, that's a great Teen Wolf costume. You're like, yeah, it's pretty good. Do you have any spicy food I can eat? Because trust me, I can eat anything now. It doesn't work on adults, though. It only works on kids. However, you can make your kids take it and they become all furry. You're like, hey, look at my Ewoks. I got Ewoks for Halloween. And they're like, dad, please. I want to be, I want to go back to school. I'm tired of looking like this. Shut up. You can stop taking it November 1st. So, yeah. Werewolf story. Thank you, Mason. Little kids turn into werewolves. That's hilarious. It's, it's adorable, too. You should see the photos. Like, I mean, yeah, they're, they're probably quite miserable, but they, they, it's a little, little, little puppy people. Little puppy people. Here's a new segment. I'm never going to do this again. I'm just doing it because it's Friday, and this is my fifth episode recorded in a row. Today's segment, and feel free to, <laughs> feel free to skip ahead five minutes. Today's segment is Jason pitches a movie to an audience who has no power to make said movie. Great segment, but it'll only be done once. The year is 2080. Long long time in the future, right? And all the cars are self-driving. It's a beautiful, shining city. Like, these cars are like... like you. It's like a row of cars, perfectly ordered, coming through town. The roads are all, like, robotic, censored and stuff. C-3PO Street. <laughs> all, all the automated cars are coming down the road. Perfect, orderly society. Everyone's just waking up to go to work. Everyone's wearing like shiny, shiny clothes. They look like the future from Minority Report mixed with the future from Demolition Man. It's just, just a really like bright future. You're like, didn't a bunch of people die in those movies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just talking about the Asiatic. Asiatic? Whatever. It looks nice. And as these cars are doing their commute down this automated road, <laughs> you're like, Jason, just tell a goat story. As these cars are doing their commute down an automated road, vroom, vroom, vroom. A monster truck flattens a bunch of cars just running off the roads. Now, the police cars are also like self-driving. The cops are just in the back seat and they're like, go car, go. But then the road like shifts so the cop car can get to where it's going. But it's still like on an automated road. It has no off-road capability while they're watching this big big monster truck with these giant wheels just jump over the roads and smash cars. He gets in front of a bank, a bunch of people come out with guns, kick in the door, steal the money, and while the cops are still trying to, to get their automated car there, big truck goes off. <laughs> and then they're back in the police precinct, and the sheriff, not the sheriff, the police chief is like, this is the third big wheel monster truck robbery this week. we got to stop these guys. And they're like, but sir, all the roads are automated. Like, we don't know how to make our cars do that. That's like old technology. That that technology was made illegal like 50 years ago when they had all these greenhouse emission gas policies passed. You can put a little political thing in there. They're like, yeah, remember when that president took over and he made us get rid of like cow farts or whatever? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I know. So they had to get rid of all the vehicles. So that's why it's this beautiful like green, everything's solar powered, right? You get a little bit of political subtext in there. So anyways, you know, or or not, I don't care. Whatever backstory, cars are illegal. Everything is solar powered, little egg pod cars that are self-controlled. Maybe people are getting too many traffic tickets. Whatever, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. That's that's for you guys to figure out, you're the producer. So anyways, they're like, we have to stop this monster truck. We, we can't, none of our cars can catch it. And then one of the young officers goes, wait a second, I think I have a plan. And then he's like walking through the streets because he doesn't want to drive a car because they suck. He knows they suck. And you hear like Limp Biscuits start playing over the soundtrack. Roll and roll and roll and roll and what? Keep roll and roll. And the guy is walking and he goes into this museum, like this deserted automobile museum. And he's walking through it. Of course, it's deserted. Otherwise, he would have come up with this plan earlier. He's walking through the museum and he finds what he's looking for. And then we see that officer's name tag. It's Lieutenant Toretto, and he's looking at his great-great-grandfather's Dodge Charger. This movie is 
the <laughs> Fast and the Furious, but it takes place in the future. It's called The Last of the Furious. And he, it's Dom Toretto's great, great grandson driving around this car. And the whole movie is just smashing over nerds and they're like efficient, fuel efficient vehicles. And you're like, Jason, that's cool. I know. Thank you. And here's the end of the trailer. You see, <laughs> you see the big rig driving through like this high tech building and, and Lieutenant Toretto's driving and he's like, has some hot chick who just magically appears in the passenger seat. She was in the museum. <laughs> She was in the museum the whole time. She got locked in, so she's dressed like a hot chick from 2013. And I, there was enough food for her for 60 years. And she hasn't aged, but anyways, the car. So the big the monster truck is driving through this high-tech building. The charger's right behind it, and you see the monster truck like smash through the wall. And and. Uh, Dom Toretto Jr. is driving the car and he goes, turns to the hot chick and he's like, hold on. And then he goes through the window. They're on the moon. <laughs> They're on the moon. <laughs> and so they've left this domed city on the moon. <laughs> and we just see the vehicles fly, flying up into the Flying up into the night sky. They're like, they're just going too fast. They can't even be held on the moon with the gravitational pull. So the last shot you see in the trailer is just this big rig, this monster truck flying through space, and this charger flying after it. Dude, tell me you wouldn't watch that movie. James Wan, I know you listen to this podcast, make it happen. The last, the last of the Furious. Okay. There we go. Let's go ahead and get back to the actual topic of this podcast. Don't worry, guys. I won't do that again. I <laughs> okay, let's let me drink some of this Jason juice. It was it J juice. It's the same cup. Anyways, here we go. <laughs> let's go to Malawi. Mason Norbeck also recommended this story. This is the last story of Vampire Week. It's been a fun week. It's been a fun week. So. Let's go to Malawi. We're going to take Dom Toretto's charger. And we're going to drive from the moon. We're going to crash land in Malawi. We're going back to 2017. Very, very recent story. Very recent story. And I tried to see if it's happening nowadays, and I'm pretty sure it is. But you'll understand why we're not getting any reporters over there. Malawi is a country. This is this mostly affected regions in the south. But, but it, again, it's pretty widespread. It's, and it actually has gone over into other countries as well. There's a Belgian couple driving through Malawi. And as they're driving down the road, a mob just kind of appears out of nowhere and begins attacking the vehicle, begins dragging them out. And it, obviously, you're going to be petrified. You're driving down the road. Your car gets surrounded by 20 people. They have, are armed with machetes. They're armed with rocks. They're banging on your car. They're able to get through the windows. They start punching through the windows if you're lucky. They're, try, they're dragging you out of the car. But what they're calling you, Send shivers up your spine. They're calling you bloodsuckers. They're kicking you in the face. Vampires beating you up. Cops show up, disperse the mob. There was this entrepreneur, this business owner named Orlando Champonda, also in the same area. He's at his house, enjoying just like reading the newspaper. He says, There's just nothing printed because all the reporters have left. They're like, screw this. Not going to be here. It's the Daily Malawi, and it's just it's just they give you a notepad, and they're like, make your own news up. We're out. He's sitting at home. 2,000 people show up at his house. You're like, party? No. Mob. You should have guessed it from the first part. Mob shows up, calling him a vampire, calling him a drinker of human blood. They lay siege to his house. They're also armed with machetes and stones, and he's hiding in his house. They're laying siege to his house. The police show up, and it takes the police five hours. Uh, 2,000 people surrounding a house. Like, he had to, I'm sure it was probably, like, like a Home Alone type thing. Where he, had like, he was, like, heating up irons, and they're, like, hitting people on heads. And, like, taking ladders and putting tacks in them or whatever. He's able to evade the attackers for five hours, which is quite the feat. The police show up, and it takes them five hours to disperse this crowd. 2,000 people is a lot of people. Police finally start shooting tear gas into the crowd, which, really, that should be happening in the first five minutes. But... They get the crowd dispersed. Now, this was reported in 2017. It had been happened earlier that year. What had happened were you having these mobs of people surround dudes, chicks, it doesn't matter, killing them. 
they had nine people killed over the past previous months. A lot of people just attacked, but nine people killed. One of them was a dude with epilepsy, and they're like, ah, the vampire, look at that the weirdo vampire over there, stoned him, and then set him on fire while he was still alive. So, basically, they were just attacking these people. They believed that vampires had invaded their country. August 2018. It's funny, because we talk a lot, I talked about the daycare center on yesterday's episode, and I was like, it's nothing. Like, that story, it's just a daycare center that's gross looking. People have created this whole myth about it. And then you have this here. You have this little story I'm about to tell you. Completely under the rug. Never heard about it before. It should be fodder for conspiracy theorists. I don't know why it's not. In 2018, the BBC sent a television crew, sent a film crew out to go document a string of murders in Malawi. They find the killer. They go undercover, right? They meet up with the killer. And the killer is killing children and selling the blood and body parts of the children to wealthy people. So all of that stuff you want to pretend happens in Salt Lake City, I'm not going to preach about that again, but all the stuff you want to pretend about happens in Salt Lake City was happening here. The point where an investigative film crew was able to track him down and get him to talk about, oh yeah, no, I kill kids and I sell the body parts to all these wealthy people. It's a conspiracy theorist wet dream, really. As they're doing this undercover sting on this guy, a bunch of vampire hunters show up. A mob shows up and lays siege to these guys and the killer gets away. They never found him again. And the BBC crew, they were like, we thought we were going to die. Like, we didn't know what was happening. We just got surrounded by a mob. People are calling us vampires attacking us. Now, Malawi is the sixth poorest nation in the world. And it's the, the reaction to all of this is so bizarre. So here's where, let's go ahead and go back to where these stories came from. You started getting people in towns saying, I woke up in the middle of the night. And there was a light like fire in my room. And I felt like the blood was getting sucked out of me. Here's a quote from one of the people who said they were attacked by a vampire. This is not hearsay. I know my blood was sucked. I saw light on the corner of my roof. I failed to stand up from my bed and felt something piercing my left arm. The other person who said they saw the light like fire in the room, they also felt a piercing in their finger. Now, those aren't the only two people. Other people have reported these things, but those two quotes were used over and over again because the problem is, is like, humanitarian groups were pulling their people out. They're like, we cannot guarantee your safety. Uh, There was like some UN outreach group pulled their people out. They're like, we can't guarantee your safety. These mobs are just thinking everyone's a vampire. So there aren't a lot of reporters on the ground to get more quotes, but this surge of attacks getting your blood sucked out. So... What's weird, though, is that the accounts we do have from, or the articles we do have regarding this, everyone seems to go, oh, they don't really believe in vampires. They believe in this. Let me read you two of these headlines here. I think they're interesting way, the way that Western journalists are looking at this story. One of the headlines is, how colonialism fueled deadly anti-vampire hysteria in Malawi. Another headline, Climate Change is Creating Vampires in Malawi. Fairly clickbaity. But what these articles, almost every article I read on this said, listen, these people don't actually believe in physical vampires. What they believe in is the inequality between the rich and the poor. They see themselves as very poor and they see other people with money. And it's a metaphorical vampire, you see. It's not a real vampire. And that's when they say, oh, the climate change is destroying the farmland. It's mostly agricultural. And they're upset at what's going on. So they've created the rumor of the vampire to focus their anger on the people who are more wealthy than them. Now, even some people who do believe it's a physical vampire say, listen, I'll be honest with you. There's a bunch of crooks, a bunch of thieves and thugs that are using the cover of the vampire story to go around and beat people up and steal stuff. I'll be honest with you. However... I do believe vampires are it's sucking people's blood. The president of Malawi said in a statement, if people are using witchcraft to suck people's blood, I will deal with them. That was President Peter Matharika. But later, he said, there is no evidence of blood suckers. It is a lie meant to destabilize the region. Those spreading rumors will face the law. Why are they pushing the idea so hard that these are metaphorical vampires? I find that really weird. And I don't really subscribe to the fake news thing a lot. But I find that really weird when in the same articles, people are like, yeah, I was sleeping in bed and something came into my room and started sucking my blood. In those same articles, they'll say, 
really, people don't believe in vampires. It's just a way for them to focus their anger at the rich. But I'm like, you just included two accounts of people who said they were physically attacked by vampires. They didn't say Bill Gates and Donald Trump came into their room and took their money. They said, I saw a light and something pricked my finger and the blood got sucked out. In Mozambique, neighboring country, which is where this, where this really started, the, the vampire paranoia spread from Mozambique, the people started saying there was this town, and these people said, the vampires are attacking us and you're not doing anything about it. And the police are like, well, there's no vampires. And then the people go, you're protecting the vampires. The police is actively protecting the vampires that are attacking us. And it got so bad, the town's administrator, which is like the top top dog, had to leave the city because the people were convinced that the police and the local government were aiding vampires and attacking the populace. Let's look at a couple of, of the theories here. One is that the media is correct, and the, this is all just a big misunderstanding. When they say bloodsuckers and vampires, what they really mean is income inequality. So that's why they're attacking people. It's not because they not because they actually believe in witchcraft and vampires. It's that they are trying to, you know, economic revolution. Forget the forget that the president said anything about going after people who suck people's blood. No, 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 no. Remember his second statement saying, no, 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 no. It's to destabilize the regions. Just rumor. I, this when I was reading the story it reminded me of the Chupa Chupa. That was a, a that would think that was like episode seventy something. Where I covered Operation Plate. It was Brazil's biggest, Brazil's Roswell is what I called it. One of the biggest UFO sightings in Brazil. And it went on for months. And people would say they'd wake up in the middle of the night, there'd be a bright light in their room, and they would have piercing pains in parts of their body. They felt that the blood was being sucked out of them, so they called them chupa chupas or suck sucks. And when I was reading this story, that's really what it reminded me of, honestly. I was thinking maybe there's more of like an alien belief here, more of an alien connection. People weren't safe in their houses. It was happening all the time. Now, in Brazil, it was in one particular region, and they're just like, well, this sucks. And they didn't really know what to do, and they got some outside help, and then the Air Force ended up showing up, the Brazilian Air Force, investigating it, and it went away after a couple months. This one, these dudes aren't messing around. One, I don't think Malawi has an Air Force. And two, they're like, oh, no, I got bit by a vampire. I'm going to smash your house to pieces. Now, people have said... In Malawi, because you go, well, how come it's only like the Belgian couple or it's, it's other than the epileptic guy, the other entrepreneur stuff like that, the BBC film crew, people have said in Malawi, kind of, you, there's nothing for free. If you have nice things, it means you did something bad to get them. So that's a real conspiratorial belief. Someone's doing better than you, they must be a vampire. But that doesn't mean that I think they're hunting metaphorical vampires. And that seems to be You see someone who's doing something nice, you go, oh, they must be a physical vampire, so let's go attack them. Because if I don't, then they're going to kill me. These type of rumors aren't new. In 1930s in Zambia, which I don't think is around anymore, but colonial Zambia, there was a rumor that Europeans were taking the blood out of native African people and turning them into cough drops. So again, I think there is kind of, you can kind of draw a connection between like colonialism, people coming into your country, and you thinking of them as being bloodsuckers. But it's one thing for me to go, my boss really abuses me versus my boss <laughs> sneaks into my room at night, pricks my finger, and drinks my blood. Like, I think that, that that is what they feel is actually happening. They're under physical assault, and that's why they're physically assaulting other people and killing other people. But here's the thing. Now, of course, I don't expect Vice Magazine or wherever I got these uh, articles from and thanks for this uh, to Mason. Mason, this I don't know if I said this earlier. This is one of the topics Mason sent me. But British newspapers, BBC.com, Vice.com. I don't expect them to say vampires are real. But let's look at this logically for a second. If you were a vampire, where would you go? Like, really? If you were a vampire and you wanted to feed indiscriminately, people have always said, oh, you know, you go to like war. I think I said that on an early episode too. Go to a war. Go to a war-torn area. You feed off all sorts of people, but you'd also have a higher chance of getting blown up by a mortar shell. It's not like a vampire from the 17th century is like, oh, I got bayoneted, big deal, pulls it out, stabs a guy. I mean, you're walking through a battlefield, a Moab falls on top of you. I don't think Dracula can tank a bomb that's built to wipe out battalions of troops. I don't think Dracula can even walk away from that. So you could go to a battlefield, but you know, then some like Nazi may break out a flamethrower and set you on fire. If you were a vampire and you wanted to hunt indiscriminately, 
you, if you can find one of the top 10 poorest countries on the planet, that's a place to go. You wouldn't be a vampire in Beverly Hills. You would be a vampire in Malawi. I don't even think you'd be like a vampire in, in a bad neighborhood in LA. Because again, there's just too much stuff going on. But if you just wanted to eat, that's where you would go. It'd be the perfect cover for you. And if you were one of those highfalutin vampires who took all of his money from the 16th century and like invested it, you would totally be connected to everything and be like, I just tell people. It's funny because they go out of their way to say, no, no, these vampires aren't real. But the average person who reads it, including me, goes, no, duh, of course they're not. Like, you don't have to tell me that vampires aren't real. Vampires are one of the things that I, I would like to be real. Like, Bigfoot, I could take them or leave them. But I would love if vampires really existed. But they don't have to say, I, I know vampires aren't really attacking. I don't know what is going on down there. It may be some weird superstition. Maybe UFO. Could be a vampire. I don't know. But then the fact that the thing is, is they try so hard to prove to me that it's not a vampire by making all of these cultural or colonial or environment. That, the environmental one was the weirdest thing, but environmental connections to it, that that makes me more suspicious. It's just like, what? Like, just say, oh, it's an old folklore tale. Well, of course, there's not vampires there. I don't know why they have to keep doing these write ups saying, no, no vampires over there. It's this. It's the fact that there hasn't been any rain that's making the vampires attack people. And the weirdest thing of all was the serial killer who was killing kids. You didn't think I was going to get back to that. I'm going to tantalize you with that horrible detail. The serial killer who, as a business, is killing kids and selling their blood and body parts to wealthy people was only in one article, the BBC article. And that is the most important detail because that is proof of not necessarily vampires, but a vampiric activity. Wasn't a legend, wasn't a myth or a fable. He was a man under investigation who got away. Something is haunting the people of Malawi. They could simply be haunted by their fears of a paranormal creature. And whenever they wake up with an unusual pain or see something odd at night... They attribute it to a vampire. They may be haunted by the ghosts of the past still affecting them economically and culturally. They could be haunted by thieves using the guise of supernatural enemies to lay siege to people's personal belongings. They may be haunted by all those things, but we know for sure that they are haunted by a man who kills and sells kids' body parts. We know that for a fact. Who is that dude selling blood and body parts to? There is no reason why you would need blood and body parts from children unless you were a vampire. There's no other reason. Someone's not running a cloning workshop over there. The only reason you would need to buy that stuff is if you were a vampire. In Molo, I, I just, I, 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 I don't understand that. And the fact that this guy can make a living doing it means that either he's getting a lot of money for what he does, or he has multiple clients, or both. If there are vampires anywhere in the world, they're in Malawi. I find it convenient that we have all these other explanations for why people say there's vampires. I find it incredibly convenient that the president changed what he said. I also find it convenient that every news story regarding these incidents ended in 2018. We haven't heard anything since. Secrecy, confusion, chaos, paranoia. The perfect place for a vampire to hunt is Malawi. And it's even better... If you have that blood and gore delivered right to your doorstep. When the president of the country changes what he said to say vampires don't exist, even though he previously said that they did, he's protecting somebody more powerful than he is. And how can a mob try to fight something that powerful? They can't. They can just constantly be redirected to attack the wrong targets. 
And all the while, it is the perfect cover for a creature that feeds on human blood. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. <laughs>